Um, I'm Lena von Nachso, the um, Consortium Deputy um, Coordinator and responsible for learning and change. The Dunradak um, Consortium <coughs> is a consortium that invests in building long-term solutions and progress towards reintegration in Somalia. Um, this is the second of three learning events which we have organized to share with you our findings and key lessons learned through the implementation during these past four years of our program. Today's event has um, five sections with a question and answer session at the end. Damadak has an adaptive management approach, adapting its pro programming based on evidence. The program has invested in a lot of um, generation um, of, of evidence, um, forming an evidence base. And we use this evidence to adapt our programming for greater impact. And we would like to share what we have learned um, in order for others to benefit from it too. Addressing displacement and finding durable solutions in Somalia is complex. To address any complex issues and challenges, we need to first better understand these and then respond with a multi-sector um, response, multi-sector solutions, integrated programming and increased coordination across the whole width of the HDP nexus based on this evidence. This event is designed to share some of our key findings in the Somali context, to reflect on collective opportunities, to make public the tool that we use to measure progress towards integration, the Local Reintegration Assessment, or short, LORA. And we would also like to stress more generally the importance of monitoring, evaluation and adaptive management in fledgling environments such as Somalia. With this, um, I would like to hand over to Laura Bennison, the consortium coordinator, who will give a brief background about the Damada Consortium before Jake Peters of FCDO will share the donor perspective. It's just a little bit about Danwadag, uh, the Durable Solutions Consortium itself. Some of you may already be familiar with us, um, but the consortium is made up of seven like-minded partners, three national and four international agencies. We're hosted by IOM Somalia, so we are unique in that we are a UN NGO uh, consortium. We have been collectively working um, on uh, solutions to displacement in Somalia since 2018, but I would like to highlight that we consider ourselves to be a third generation durable solutions consortium and that we're very much based on the learning and the gains of programs that have come before. So the EU funded uh, Rentec consortiums and also the MidNemo program, a UN um, Habitat and IOM collaboration. Both of those uh, programs in itself gave us very valuable learning in order to build uh, the logic model and the theory of change for Danodag and to ensure that our program was very much based on evidence coming from the field before us. We, this first phase of Danodag is a multi um, and as I mentioned earlier, it will end actually at uh, the end of this month of March 2022. And we have been funded to this point by uh, UK Aid or FCDO. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're UN led and we're partnering with a coalition of international and national NGOs that really brings a wealth of expertise and contextual experience to the table. So what we have been able to do over the last four years has really been um, contingent on the expertise that these partners have really brought um, to the consortium. So the way that the uh, program has been designed, it's very much to take advantage of that and to ensure that the added value of each partner is capitalized on. Um, in terms of our coverage, we have been working in, um, in Mogadishu in, in BRA, um, in Baidura in Afgoi, in Southwest State, and also Kismayo in, in Jubaland State. Our target has very much been displacement affected communities. So taking a very inclusive approach to solutions and ensuring that we are addressing challenges um, and specific uh, displacement related vulnerabilities, not just for IDPs themselves, but also for their hosting communities and also for returnees where they um, are also resident in the same population. So taking a very much area-based, inclusive approach to uh, sustainable solutions. 
And particular attention through the lifespan of the program has also been given to the agency of vulnerable groups, including women and girls and also youth as well. So particularly for some of our livelihoods components, making sure that the, um, the specific uh, vulnerabilities related to these groups were very much integrated through those interventions design. So this is our pathway to, to reintegration and to reduce displacement in Somalia. So we see these um, as building blocks. It's not a linear process um, in the way that the arrow suggests, but we have illustrated in that way to hopefully give you some, um, some understanding of the different components and how they feed in. So very much kind of establishing uh, an, an enabling environment, looking at community-driven planning processes and government leadership, so ensuring that the program from the outset is community-driven and government-led has been um, critical to the successes and to also to the learnings that we have uh, generated through the program. That has been layered with um, sustainable access to basic services, with land tenure security, which obviously we'll be focusing on in more detail in the next section, looking at more broadly at housing, land and property. And on top of that, layered with um, interventions focused on self-reliance and economic opportunities for displacement affected communities. Um, and then the idea of these components is that it would ultimately result in progress towards increased reintegration and reduced displacement related vulnerabilities for these targeted communities that we're serving. This diagram that we've shared on the right is our theory of change. So you can see our overall goal, as I mentioned, is the enhanced durable solutions towards reintegration and reduced displacement. And underneath that, we have our four key outcomes. Um, the outcome at the bottom, as you can see, is focused on adaptive learning and management to inform durable solutions decision making. Um, so again, we have embedded this key tenant of learning through the whole program to ensure that it influences not only our own programming interventions and our own adaptive approach, but also is supporting the government leadership, the government decision making around durable solutions priorities, and also influencing other actors across the humanitarian development peace nexus and the donor community as well. The current model of the program that we have now moved to, and as you can see, the sustainable integrated housing, land and property solutions are really at the centre of the work that we're doing. Um, so the idea is that actually this provides the foundation and the pivot for all the other interventions that we are layering on top as Dan would ask. So this, again, very intentional, very much based on evidence from the program recognizing that this critical importance of housing, land and property solutions. And with this, I would like to hand over now to Jake Peters, the Humanitarian Advisor of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, formerly known as DFID. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be on this journey with, um, with, with IOM, uh, Dan Rizek and, and the other partners. Um, maybe I can just start a little bit in terms of um, uh, sort of uh, FCDO's investments um, in, in sort of m and &E and learning more, more generally. Um, so uh, this is obviously a, you know, a very key priority for um, uh, FCDO's humanitarian programming in Somalia. Um, we know we've, we've made quite a lot of investment um, in, into learning and change. Really this, um, uh, this increased substantially in 2013 uh, when we decided to make the investment into a dedicated monitoring and learning um, and change platform, which we call Mesh, um, which really started out as, as having a very strong third party monitoring focus. So basically ensuring that, uh, that people were getting the assistance um, that they were supposed to, um, and really just as a kind of compliance and validation exercise. And then you know, over the last few years, it's, it's changed quite significantly, um, uh, sort of moving not away from TPM because that's a, that's a key focus, but really broadening out in terms of um, learning and change. So basically, not just are people getting the assistance, but are they getting the right assistance? Um, you know, could there be improvements? Um, what could be done differently? And I think uh, along with this shift to, to kind of broader learning and change, um, 
We've also uh, tried to shift the focus of this some monitoring and learning investment just away from something that's just beneficial to FCDO in the UK, um, but hopefully to something that's beneficial for the broader humanitarian community um, in Somalia. So, you know, recognizing that, um, you know, humanitarian work in Somalia it is challenging. It's a challenging context. Um, and, you know, in order to sort of test um, new ways of working um, and actually trying to kind of, uh, you know, shift towards, um, you know, reducing humanitarian needs um, or kind of moving away from protracted, um, protracted needs year on year on, um, you know, it's important that as, as a donor, we, we really sort of take this journey um, together with our implementing partners. So that's why we very much consider these investments we're making um, uh, as a kind of, um, as an offer, as a service to, to the broader uh, humanitarian community in Somalia. Um, you know, basically, if we, if we want our partners to, to push the boundaries, um, you know, we also need to invest in the tools and mechanisms to allow them to do this and to actually, um, to actually make the necessary changes um, um, and, and adaptation to their programming. So with that in mind, and, and now just kind of shifting to, to downward drag and, and durable solutions more specifically, um, you know, when we, when we sort of initiated our support to durable solutions programming in 2019, which we started with our, um, with our support to downward drag, um, you know, at that time, durable solutions was still a, a relatively nascent concept in Somalia. Um, you know, the, the whole focus on how, how best to integrate IDPs, um, you know, into the areas of displacement with, with the host community. Um, you know, unlike resilience programming, uh, which the UK also supports um, largely through our um, resilience consortium BRICS, um, the, uh, the level of investment, um, the length of, pro of, sort of durable solution programming was, was much less um, developed at that time. And I think quite early on um, in the design and inception um, process with, um, with Downward Dyke IOM, it became quite clear that, um, you know, really needs to come up with something to actually um, determine success and impact of this type of programming. So, so basically, while the um, uh, sort of durable solutions results framework, which we had at the time developed by um, the Interagency Standing Committee and REDS, definitely provided a good base, um, you know, focusing on the areas of physical, material, legal safety. We were also quite, we, I think we realized quite early on that there was a risk that we could achieve um, progress along a number of these indicators. Um, so people might say, you know, for example, um, report uh, improvements in basic services or, or maybe even income, but there was potentially a risk that we could make progress along those, along those sort of output and outcome indicators, but would people actually be more integrated? And I think that was, that was the challenge which we wanted to focus on. Um, so with that in mind, we did spend quite a lot of time and um, had quite a lot of discussion with um, with the, with the Downward Ag team on how we could come up with something that actually better focuses on this concept of uh, integration more, more specifically. Uh, and that led to the um, development of the local, um, uh, local reintegration index, which of course has now shifted um, to the local reintegration assessment uh, methodology. So I'm not gonna speak too much about the LORI or the LORA. Um, people much more familiar with the tool are gonna uh, talk uh, more in detail about that during the session, but um, maybe just to kind of um, just mention a, a couple of key takeaways from our side. I think in terms of this, in terms of this process of, of developing this tool. I mean, I think, I think first of all, the development of the law has really helped us to um, to actually reconsider and rethink what we want to achieve in durable solution programming in Somalia. So, what does integration look like? Um, is it achievable in terms of durable solution programming? And then even if it is achievable, uh, is it sufficient? So if people are integrated or report being uh, more integrated, but they still have high levels of, of vulnerability, then do we need to look at something else in terms of how we, um, how we assess what it is we want to achieve with durable solution programming? Um, and I think secondly, the process and the development tool has also been instrumental in terms of the adaptation we've seen um, during the Damodag program. 
I think in some ways, if things and the ways of working at the end of a multi-year program are exactly the same as the beginning, then arguably, um, you know, th there's perhaps been limited success with that program. I think when we are looking at new ways of working on new concepts, we should be seeing change. And that's something that we need to um, embrace. And I think as donors, it's definitely something that we need to um, we need to facilitate in terms of ensuring that partners have that flexibility required. Um, and I think we can definitely say that the, um, uh, the Damradag program as it's ending is certainly um, quite different to how it started. So that in itself for me is definitely a measure of, um, of success and progress. And lastly, just to say, um, you know, certainly the, um, the learning journey for durable solutions isn't over, uh, nor should it be. Um, and I, I even think the law as a tool uh, will probably look different in, in sort of two or three years time than it does now. Um, but, um, you know, I think, I think as, as donors and implementing partners, it, it's just really important that we continue to invest in this journey. Um, and, you know, I think where we're at now with the, some new generation of durable solutions programs starting, we, we're definitely in a good opportunity to um, to collectively reflect on how we can, um, how we can support um, this kind of learning journey together over the next few years. So um, thank you. And um, with that in mind, I'll, I'll hand back over to Lena. Thank you very much, um, Jake, for this. Um, not only donors, but also the government and all HDP Nexus actors share an equal responsibility in ensuring that solutions are better informed and targeted to location-specific displacement needs. The lack of an evidence base and a comprehensive tool to measure progress towards integration, which Jake um, just mentioned in his address as well, led to Damadag, encouraged by FCDO, wanting to develop a tool that could measure the progress, identify displacement-specific vulnerabilities, and help us think further around when the end of displacement might be reached. Somalia has approximately 2.9 million IDPs, and now with the current drought, um, it will be more. Um, we wanted to know who these 2.9 million are, recognizing that they're not all the same, that they have different displacement-specific um, vulnerabilities, different needs, and also different perspectives with regards to how they feel about their own integration. In a context where the needs constantly outstrip the resources, we needed to find a way to prioritize based on the vulnerabilities. Developing the LoRa helped us zoom in on these vulnerabilities and to understand how they are changing over time as well. On the back of this understanding, we then were able to adapt our implementation again, as Jake just referred to it, Damadag as it is now, um, isn't quite the same as we started out um, and this is something positive as we learned um, as we went along. Um, so we adapt our implementation um, using adaptive management and an area-based approach. Was it at times challenging to pilot, adapt, throw some things completely overboard, continue to adapt um, and reprogram? It certainly was. Um, and, but was it worth it? Um, we really think it was. Um, it enabled us to learn as we went along and ultimately it also enabled us to have a greater impact. This is why we would like to share what we have found with you today. Measuring progress towards local integration of displaced persons in Somalia. There are an estimated 2.9 million internally displaced persons or IDPs in Somalia. Most of them move to urban centers where they live in informal settlements with limited progress towards integration. The Danwadag Durable Solutions Consortium is supporting the Somali government to find long-term solutions to displacement in Somalia. To help achieve this, Danwadag developed the Local Reintegration Assessment, or LORA, to understand the unique vulnerabilities of Somali communities that are affected by displacement, to measure progress towards reducing these, and to identify factors that influence how well integrated IDPs feel. The LORA is a household-level survey tailored to the Somali context. It provides evidence to design and improve durable solutions programming for greater impact. The LORA measures over time 1. 
levels of perceived integration of IDPs, and two, inequalities between IDPs and their host communities. How was the LoRa developed? Together with local communities, governments, and durable solution stakeholders, Danwadag defined local integration in the Somali context. Then, a questionnaire was created using the Durable Solutions Framework from the Interagency Standing Committee, IASC, to measure physical, material, and legal safety of IDPs, including 1. Adequate standard of living 2. Access to economic opportunities 3. Access and rights to housing, land, and property 4. Participation in public and community affairs 5. Access to documentation, effective remedies, and justice and 6. Social cohesion How does the LORA work? Danwadag surveyed more than 3,000 households in four urban centers in Somalia repeatedly in 2019, 2020, and 2021. To analyze the data, two logistic regression models were used. Model 1 links IDP's physical, material, and legal safety to how well integrated IDPs feel. Over time, significant factors for IDPs to feel integrated changed. Model 2 identifies inequalities between IDPs and their host community. Here, you see the results of our 2020 survey with percentages indicating the inequality levels between host community and IDPs and areas identified to reduce these. Improve social cohesion, especially in Baidoa. Focus on housing quality and land tenure security, especially in Mogadishu and Kismayo. Enable families to buy enough food in Baidoa and Kismayo and focus on providing access to legal and financial services, especially in Kismayo. Focus on livelihoods activities to increase income and coping capacities. The LoRa can be used in different contexts. It proved a valuable tool to measure integration and displacement specific vulnerabilities, focus programming on most significant factors for reintegration and durable solutions, and create an evidence base to inform an area-based approach. How can others use and adapt the LoRa? 1. Adapt the questionnaire to the local context, but keep it broad enough to allow for changes over time. 2. Include specific program components. 3. Adapt the aspects surveyed and their weighting within the local context. 4. Further develop the survey tool and how the logistic model is calculated. What next? While achieving the level of host communities is a vital step for IDPs, we envision defining further steps towards achieving reintegration and durable solutions beyond this to ensure realistic, context-specific standards are used to measure and inform priorities for durable solutions. To access resources, visit somalia.iom.int slash durable dash solutions. Developing the LoRa was a very iterative process with many stakeholders involved. And I will now show you a short video with a message of one of the persons involved in this process. It's Santiago Cordova, a partner of Equidad y Desarrollo in Ecuador, who had previously worked on developing an integration index for UNHCR in Ecuador when we approached him. Developing LoRa was a collaboration across continents. Upon request from Dan Guadac, equality and development consultants in Ecuador based the first version of LoRa on an index developed for UNHCR in Ecuador. We did multiple consultations with Somali and durable solutions tech stakeholders to adapt it to the local context. Dangwadak then further developed the originally used method with an expert of statistics for sustainable development in the US and one in Kenya. We discussed the method with colleagues from IOM Iraq and with colleagues from a Kenyan think tank. We had several sessions with the Joint IDP Profiling Service Learning Group to further improve the method with colleagues' input from across the globe. 
The process was complex, but we are very happy with the outcome and, ho and hope this can help others to focus on what has the most impact working towards sustainable solutions for displacement. As mentioned earlier and in the video played in the beginning, the LoRa was developed to systematically determine displacement-specific vulnerabilities, to determine what makes IDPs feel integrated, to adapt programming accordingly, and to monitor IDPs' progress towards reintegration in Badoa, Mogadishu, Afgoi, and Kismayo, which is Damadak's area of operation currently. The LoRa combines subjective and objective criteria of reintegration and collects data at household level for the following thematic areas. Household composition and literacy, perceived levels of integration, safety and security, social cohesion and trust in institutions specifically, participation in public affairs, access to tenure security, housing, land and property, access to documentation, access to basic services, including WASH, health, education and justice, school attendance rates, and questions relating to the Self-Reliance Index and the Coping Strategy Index. As explained briefly in the video, the LoRa then uses two regression models to analyze this data. I would like to explain a little bit more about why we're using this method. Model 1 compares IDP's physical, material and legal safety to that of their surrounding host communities. This is because we found it necessary to find a realistic standard against which to compare the progress of IDPs. If we were to use international standards in a context where the vulnerabilities are very high and needs constantly outstrip the resources, we would struggle to see progress and would find it challenging to understand where to put priorities. It would also not be possible to understand what the displacement-specific vulnerabilities are and what the general vulnerabilities of the urban poor are that are not related to displacement. We can determine what these displacement-specific vulnerabilities are, as our assessment shows that the inequalities between IDPs and host communities with regards to all of these um, aspects um, decrease, increase, um, but in our case actually decrease. And I will provide some examples in a minute. So we do this by predicting the probability of an IDP household becoming a host community member. Model 2 shows us how well integrated IDPs actually feel and it det determines which factors are relevant um, in this. We have been asked many times as we developed um, this method why we are using the perception of integration in our assessment as this is a soft and subjective component. This is true. Um, it is a subjective measure, however, it is not the only measure we use and we think that only looking at the objective criteria such as security, income, housing quality, tenure documentation, etc. Um, is not enough. We also need to understand how well integrated IDPs feel and which factors influence this perceived level of integration. If in an ideal situation, an IDP has access to all the basic and legal services, can exercise his or her own rights without discrimination based on their displacement, has an income that allows him or her to provide for the family, they can still feel that they're not integrated. This can influence not only their mental well-being, but also social cohesion and whether they want to stay in the place where they have settled. If we want to preserve our investments on IDP's pathways to reintegration, we also need to understand what makes IDP's feel integrated and then work to improve these aspects. As you have seen in the video at the beginning, the inequalities between IDP's and host communities have changed between when we started the program, now almost four years ago, and now that we're closing out the program. The inequalities have significantly re reduced across a wide variety of aspects that we surveyed. No significant inequalities exist anymore with regards to safe access to food, to the number of meals that households um, can consume and can afford um, to buy, to the type of water source that they have access to, to their access to markets, to land documentation, daily expenditure, access to financial services, income diversity or access to legal services. No significant inequalities either exist with regards to access to documentation, However, the number for this were very low, both for host communities and IDPs, so this result um, is to be interpreted with caution. 
Inequalities remain with regards to education and softer components, um, that is, social cohesion aspects. Over the time span of the program, also aspects for IDPs to feel integrated change, but trust in institutions remained the key factor influencing how well integrated IDPs feel. Um, maybe also important to mention that um, institutions was measured across a very wide variety of types of institutions. As of la late 2021, 66% of IDPs in our area of programming feel well integrated, which is an increase by almost 30% from 2019, when only 37% reported to feel well integrated. Push and pull factors remained largely the same, with IDPs leaving their places of origin, mostly because of drought, flooding and conflict, and choosing the place to go to because of the absence of conflict, food aid and income opportunities. The law and practice. So how did we actually use this evidence? Here you see the results of our 2021 survey and inequalities between IDPs and host communities. The percentages you see indicate the difference for each of the aspects or um, variables between IDPs and host communities for each of these specific locations. If you look at the dark blue box relatively towards the top left and the large inequalities with regards to social cohesion in Baidoa, following the LoRa analysis showing that social cohesion was an issue specifically in Baidoa, we invested a lot more in social cohesion, for example, by building community centers that already had been a community priority before, um, but were over um, by doing increased dispute resolution mechanisms, trainings in communities, and by ensuring IDP's inclusion in community-driven making processes, as well as by increasing information sessions with host communities to explain what the benefits of having IDPs relocate to near their houses would be for them. If you look at the red boxes, based on the LoRa evidence that expenditure and meals per day were displacement-specific vulnerabilities, we invested into activities that would increase households' income and therefore their ability to afford more meals, for example, through starting a livelihoods graduation program under one of our consortium members. If you look at the purple boxes and one of our most important evidence, the LoRa identified that housing quality and, not displayed here, land tenure security is a major issue for displaced populations, leading to repeated evictions, interrupting IDP's pathways to recovery, integration and more self-reliance. Although we already had HLP, housing, land and property, as one of our main program components, realizing the importance of land tenure security to address displacement we shifted the program towards having land tenure security at the core of our program, layering other interventions um, on top of it for greater impact. And finally, and finally, if you look at the light blue boxes, the law identified that access to legal services was a displacement specific issue. Interestingly, this was not an issue a year prior, and we think that um, might be the case because of other displacement-specific vulnerabilities reducing already at this stage, and therefore secondary um, issues such as access to legal services could come out more clearly. Following this evidence, Dumbadag invested more into provision of legal services related to HLP rights violation and forged strategic partnerships with other programs that focus on legal services, such as the UAID-funded Expanding Access to Justice program. Similarly, again, um, here you're seeing the results of our 2021 survey for the other model, where we looked at what influences how well integrated um, IDPs feel. The most significant factor, as I mentioned before, was and still is IDP's trust in institutions. Therefore, we invested, for example, further into working with government authorities to ensure inclusion of IDP's needs in policies, for durable solutions units um, to be supported, for the government eviction task forces to be set up and supported, and for the development of a national durable solutions strategy um, inclusive of IDP's to be supported. As the second most important aspect, depending on the location, as you can see um, in the um, chart or in the table rather, um, was the number of meals that families could eat in Baidoa and Kismayo specifically. 
This was addressed through diversification of household income and increased livelihood support, as mentioned earlier. Here you can see what conclusions we are drawing from our endline results, of which vulnerabilities still need to be addressed. But I won't go into much more detail on this at this point. Um, you can read all about it in our current um, LoRa endline report. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you, Lena. Um, I'm Ali Mohamed Ali, Program Director for Credo and a partner of uh, Denwadak uh, Consortium. Um, to carry forward on the discussion in terms of the learning, uh, the LoRa provided uh, Denwadak uh, the evidence based from which to reflect and adapt programming based on increased understanding of what makes the most impact for IDPs and their pathway to a disintegration. Uh, we also moved uh, to further enforce our integrated approach with interventions layered on top of landed tenant security interventions, ensuring greater impact. Uh, the approach that Laura spoke to earlier with a different component anchored in land security tenor, this was developed following our Laura assessment. Um, durable solutions cannot be achieved without land tenant security and without overall self-reliance of displacement affected communities. We need to understand what the displacement specific vulnerabilities are and address this to lift IDPs to at the level to host community. Then we need to look further to define and endorse criteria that go beyond the level of host community for displacement affected communities to achieve displacement related self-reliance. Uh, looking further into contextualization, area based uh, approach informed by evidence helped us prioritize and work towards a long-term vision of durable solution, linking IDP settlements, upgrading, uh, relocation sites, and others with urban development plans. In order to use this evidence, programs should be adaptive and donors willing to take risks to pilot new approaches that can be upscaled and replicated. While working towards durable solutions is important, we need to be able to power shocks to preserve investment into a long-term uh, progress. In Denwada, we did this through a dual approach, including a crisis modifier component into our programming. Uh, we did not have this included in our program from the outset, but quickly realized that working towards a long-term solution without this in a context with a repeated crisis is not feasible. Here is again, it needs uh, the donor's flexibility to accommodate this type of approach and we need, and we were lucky to have FCDO support this. For Gredo specifically, uh, during the LoRa process, what we learned is that uh, the, the needs of the IDPs and both host community could not be covered within the parameters of Dangwada. So we had to leverage and use other programs within the organization to meet the needs of, of the community uh, in overall. Um, for partner, um, consortium partner like Concern, following results of the LoRa 1 and 2 assessment, that access to basic steps was relatively high among the target communities, and social integration played a significant role in a perceived integration levels. Uh, they prioritized the deduct the education program in 2020 and 2021 systemically scaled back health and wash programs in favor of more community engagement, uh, engagement, updates of community action plans, and mobilization of dark committee, committee plans. Plans for community centers and a football fields could not be realized due to the budget cuts. Uh, we learned what we learned from Laura is that it makes the little sense of target-based status, but we need, to, we need to start based on specific displacement-related vulnerabilities. An IDP in one settlement in BRA has a different vulnerabilities as compared to a family in another settlement or in another town. So for lasting solution, the biggest challenge of all must be tackled, land tenant security, in absence of uh, tenant security and with the majority of IDPs squatting in a private land without tenant documentation, IDPs will continue to face evictions, 
the step in the pathway to integration. Since displacement is a complex issue, the response must be multisectoral and integrated. On top of our HLB interventions, we can lay a provision of access to sustainable basic service and interventions aimed at increasing economic opportunities. In all of these, locally led solutions under government leadership are key, as explained in the learning event last week. The key success under Dangwadak will have not been possible without government leadership and investment. So how can you adapt and use the LoRa? The tools variables um, have to be reviewed to ensure that they're all relevant to your program and your program's context, including different weighting of variables depending on the context and identifying aspects that you might want to zoom in further or dig in deeper for the results um, to adequately inform your implementation. This all sounds very technical, but we're actually um, trying to develop a toolkit that you then hopefully can use um, for this to be simpler for you. The LoRa needs to be contextualized. Um, we spend a lot of time adapting the questionnaire, um, the way the questions are asked and framed to the local context, um, in our case, these specific locations in Somalia. For example, listing the types of assets that IDP would usually um, have or would not have, um, identifying the housing types that IDPs would live in, etc. Um, but always making sure that there was room for respondents to identify different options and as well that there was room for things to change um, over time. The LoRa could be carried out as a one point um, in time survey, just taking a snapshot shot of the vulnerabilities of IDPs that you're working with and how well integrated they feel. However, the tool comes to its full fruition if data is collected over time, tracking pro progress of the same households and communities. As you have seen in the video in the beginning, factors that influence how well integrated IDPs feel did change over the time span of our program, although the most significant factor remained the same throughout. Doing the LoRa as a panel survey, meaning revisiting the very same households again and again, has also enabled us to understand which inequalities between IDPs and host communities reduced in which locations and um, therefore how we could adapt our program accordingly. This is only possible if you keep the tool capable of capturing changes over time and don't settle on too few variables, even if you might think um, that some other aspects are not relevant to, their pro to your programming. They might not be now, but they might become relevant um, in a few months or even years time. The LoRa works best for programs that do vulnerability-based targeting rather than status-based targeting and for area-based programs as it is designed to zoom in on these location-specific differences. Since the added value of the tool is measuring progress and changes over time, it also means that the LoRa is appropriate in scenarios of protracted displacement where IDPs and host communities live alongside one another over a longer period of time. This also means, of course, that LoRa is best suitable for longer term programs, but as I mentioned earlier, you could also use it as a snapshot tool. It is, of course, challenging to track down these households one, two or even three years um, after you first spoke to them. And we had put in place rigorous contact procedures um, that we trained our survey team specifically on. When we started, we were really discouraged um, by people saying it's not possible to do these types of panel surveys in this environment. Um, well, we have now proven that it is indeed possible, even though um, it doesn't come without its challenges and that it is worth the effort. So what are the collective opportunities? As we worked um, to progress the discussion around um, how the end of displacement could be defined, in parallel and with input from our survey, the CCCM cluster has also worked with the government to define IDP site criteria. Both processes aim at a similar outcome, um, but at a different level. So for us, it is at household level, whereas um, for CCCM, this is at site um, level. 
being able to define the end of displacement um, and a kind of exit strategy, um, if that's what you would like to call it, for IDPs. The LoRa at household level, um, the CCCM, as I said, um, at IDP site level. Can we consider a household that has stayed in one location for a long time, that has similar levels with regards to physical, material and legal safety as compared to their surrounding host community, that owns um, maybe even a title deed to the land um, where they settled on and is accepted by their host community? Can we still call these types of households um, an IDP household? Or then at the higher level, can we consider an IDP settlement that is based on professional site planning, city expansion planning, um, integrated into city expansion planning, and um, where the households settle down, um, own communal or individual title deeds. Can we still call this an IDP site? Um, our Bawako relocation site in Badoa, for example, following these initiatives, um, we we're rethinking the criteria around the end of displacement for this specifically, and Bawako has therefore been removed um, from the list of IDP sites, and this has also been endorsed by the government. Now, does this mean that these households settled no longer have any needs? Of course, it doesn't, um, but it means that the displacement-specific vulnerabilities are no longer given and that the households have progressed um, towards durable solutions, even if they might still be part of the urban poor. This would also mean that the households could then be removed from the humanitarian caseload and transition um, to be aided by development um, programs. We must invest further, further into piloting new approaches, into generating a solid evidence base and in challenging the same status quo. The LoRa can be used in other contexts to start similar discussions and to provide evidence to enable prioritization of programming for greater impact. What next? Um, we would like to add more nuance with regards to marginalization into the LoRa to further unpack aspects that um, still remain um, a bit unclear, but bear influence on integration. We had also included multiple questions on marginalizations into our tool already, but we feel it's still not quite um, where we would like it to be. Um, not asking enough details to further enhance the discussion um, around how marginalization um, could also contribute to specific um, vulnerabilities around displacement. And as we found in our last survey, inequalities between IDPs and host communities have significantly reduced, um, important to say, for our area of programming. Um, so now we need to think a step further. What is the next appropriate benchmark to use? Um, which further steps can we define on IDP's pathway um, towards integration and durable solutions? Um, we are also planning and are in the process of making um, the LoRa data available open source. So please stay tuned. Um, it should be available soon. Um, maybe just to start with, I mean, clearly the, the scale of, of the challenge um, when it comes to IDPs in Somalia and, and integration and vulnerabilities is, is, is huge. It's, it's extremely significant. Um, you know, uh, already uh, before we were going into this drought crisis, which we find ourselves in now, uh, there are approximately 2.9 million uh, IDPs in Somalia. And, and now we're quickly seeing that number um, increase day by day, uh, probably around 3.5, 3.6 million now. Um, uh, you know, and when we look at the, the scale of the challenge and uh, the resources available, it's, it's quite clear that um, through specific durable solutions programs alone, uh, we're only going to be able to go so far in terms of addressing these issues. Um, you know, clearly, we need to also rely a lot on um, other resources from other humanitarian and, and development programs. Um, but of course, more generally with, with programming um, and, and resources that um, you know, the international community can provide, of course, there are also limitations. I mean, when you look at the issues driving displacement, uh, particularly, particularly around conflict, uh, when you look at the drivers of um, displacement-related vulnerability, particularly marginalization and exclusion, um, it's quite clear that, that programming can only do so much. Ultimately, um, we require 
um, steps to be taken, progress in regards to policy development, uh, in regards to legislation, uh, which ensures the necessary protection and rights of, of displaced people in, um, uh, in urban settings. So fortunately, you know, over the course of, of Downward Dag and I think over the last uh, few years of durable solutions programming in Somalia, we have seen some really good examples of, um, of programming, uh, policy development and development of legislation actually coming together um, which of course is which of course is necessary to to achieve the solutions we want. So a few examples have been the um, domestication of the Kampala Convention, um, which which actually sets out um, you know specific rights of, of displaced people. Um, the evictions uh, moratorium, which we saw particularly in the height of COVID, uh, providing additional protections um, for people living in um, precarious conditions uh, when it comes to their land tenure security. Um, the National Durable Solutions Strategy, um, which has been developed over the last uh, couple of years and um, I think provides a good framework in terms of what we need to achieve in Somalia. Um, and then at a more localized level, some real progress made um, in regards to uh, contributions from local authorities, particularly in regards to the provision of land, um, by Doha with the Baraco site, um, Kismayo with the, with the Luglo site, uh, and Mogadishu with the Haliwa site. Um, we're seeing more opportunities developed in other um, locations as well, such as um, Galkayo. So, um, you know, definitely some, some really good and, and strong progress um, that we can hopefully build on. Um, so maybe just as a, f a few last words, I mean, uh, there's, there's clearly a lot of opportunity moving forward. And, you know, I must say I am disappointed that, you know, I won't actually be here to see um, um, the come next phase um, of, of this programming um, through, through Damridag or Cement or other programs. Um, but I think it's also fair to say that, you know, there are a lot of challenges we also need to be able to deal with as well. Um, particularly the election situation uh, right now. And, um, you know, that's always going to be a bit of a challenge in terms of, um, uh, I suppose, kind of focus and contribution on, on, the, on the government side during this period. Um, but then, of course, the, the drought as well. And, um, you know, we're seeing that while, of course, we're trying to um, make progress in terms of durable solutions and integration, at the same time, um, we're seeing huge influxes of, of IDPs into urban areas, which is making this work even more challenging. Um, and I know that this is something that um, IOM and other partners are acutely aware of. You know, how can we how can we adapt um, these durable solutions programming at this time um, in order to be um, you know particularly relevant um, in terms of being able to respond um, to the crisis which we which we find ourselves in now. Um, I mean, I think also with this moment, sometimes there's opportunities. I mean, when it comes to um, progress, it's not necessarily um, something that's linear. I think, you know, there, there are these moments where, um, where, where I, I suppose, um, innovation and, um, um, you know, and, and sort of, um, uh, you know, I'm trying not to say progress again, um, and, and you know, and, and developments and solutions are really sort of pushed forward, um, sort of leapfrog forward. Um, and I think you know this is perhaps a moment where we see that, you know, with this with this incredible pressure in terms of new people coming to urban, urban areas, um, we can't just act like we've been doing before. Uh, we can't just hope to. Um, you know, let the situation unfold as it is and then retrofit uh, in a couple months or years time in terms of how we can actually get people out of these situations in terms of the land which they've come to and the situation with um, congestion um, and, and, you know, the precarious land tenure security we have, maybe there's opportunities to actually get in front of that. Um, but of course, that very much depends on, um, you know, bringing in that humanitarian program. And of course, um, you know, the, the, the local authorities um, definitely going to have a, a strong role uh, to play in that. So I suppose lastly, just to say, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a real privilege on my side to be, um, uh, to be part of this um, sort of innovative uh, type of programming over the last few years. And 
I really do look forward to being able to I think take what we've developed and learned in Somalia, which really is um, you know groundbreaking and and you know um, uh, sort of world leading in a lot of ways when it comes to uh, this focus on durable solution. Hopefully, that's something I can take to to other contexts. Um, I will uh, moderate this uh, this session um, on the Q and A, and already we've had um, one comment and. Um, uh, four questions so far. Um, a question from uh, Priscilla, um, maybe to the group. Uh, she's thanking us for the presentation, um, but the question is, how does Somalia uh, define the end of displacement? Uh, that is beyond uh, the ask definition of durable solutions. And could there be some lessons we can learn in Iraq from your approach? So we will, uh, and should be keen to hear that. Anyone want to? Sure, maybe I can just start and then anyone can, can expand on it. Um, it's a very good question and I think um, after this question was, uh, was posed, I expanded a bit more about it um, in my presentation. So there is one way um, how we define it for the purpose of the LoRa, but at the same time, as I explained, there is this um, process uh, ongoing under the CCCM cluster to redefine IDP site criteria, um, including with endorsement um, by the government. Um, and this was um, aligned with um, partly of how we define it as well, but as I explained, it's, it's a different um, levels, one at household, one at um, IDP site um, level. Um, and uh, a lot is um, based around um, land tenure security, um, owning a land title deed. Um, it's of course um, based um, around how an IDP is um, defined um, by law um, in, uh, in Somalia. Um, and um, then for us specifically, um, it is defined around um, have IDPs reached the level of their surrounding host communities with regards to all of these criteria, and do they therefore, um, referring back to the IASC framework criteria, no longer have displacement specific um, needs? Um, anyone who wants to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, in terms of this question on defining the end of displacement, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, very clearly, like Somalia is urbanizing rapidly, right? And I think, um, you know, often uh, we have discussion in terms of, okay, what do we mean by IDPs and, and, and what do we mean by urban migrants and, and how are they differentiated? And we know that this is a very blurry and, and, and gray area. Um, I think, Somalia, I think uh, Somalia is the most um, rapidly urbanizing uh, country in the world, perhaps, or I think it's in the top two or three, um, particularly Mogadishu. Um, so this is a trend that's definitely going to increase. Um, so I, I don't think we, we really have a kind of strict definition yet in terms of you know, what separates displacement from, from migration. Um, I think, you know, as, as Lena said, I mean, it's, it's really looking at those displacement specific vulnerabilities um, and, and how can we how can we tackle those? Um, noticing, of course, that in Somalia, while it's good to look at, um, I suppose, other examples of good practice um, within the region or even, you know, uh, further, such as Iraq, I think it's important to also recognize that when we talk about displacement, when we talk about IDPs in Somalia, it's a very specific, it's a very specific context. And um, unfortunately, um, IDPs are often synonymous with the more marginalized groups. Uh, and that's a very, I think Somali, Somali specific uh, problem and it requires a very Somali specific solution, um, particularly in terms of the, of the government's role, um, ensuring that those who are moving into urban areas are considered um, to have the same rights um, as, as you know, the, the rest of the host population. And that goes back to my previous points. I think in terms of programming, and as, I think as Lena was saying, we can look at doing things which do reduce some of those displacement related vulnerabilities. But ultimately, I think when it comes to the IDP concept and the concept of who, you know, who, who is kind of a resident in these urban areas and who is an outsider, I mean, ultimately, that's going to be for the government and I think Somali society in general to, um, to, to have to sort of uh, resolve, resolve that one. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, the next question comes from uh, Margarita, who would like to know, um, did you observe any interesting differences in the ask based, uh, based definition of solutions? And what, uh, what did you figure out is mainly influencing the subjective perception of integration? Yeah, interesting question. Um, from, from the way it's phrased, um, it appears that um, it's mainly geared towards the uh, um, subjective um, level of perceived um, integration level and um, not the other criteria. So with regards to this, I can maybe say um, one of the key um, differences is maybe that social cohesion um, is especially um, important and um, maybe would need to be expanded upon, as I also mentioned um, already earlier, um, that we're planning to include more around marginalization um, uh, into the tool. And I think this maybe isn't quite as strong um, in the IASC um, framework. Um, but other than this, um, I don't think it is hugely different. Uh, different. Um, our tool is obviously based on the IASC framework, um, looking at, um, therefore, also looking at what the displacement specific vulnerabilities are. Um, um, in order to see whether anyone is still discriminated against um, based on these um, vulnerabilities, etc. So I don't think um, we see any um, huge differences. We just adapted it specifically um, for the Somali context. And I think there is still some work to be done to dig a little bit deep, deeper into some of the aspects, including um, social cohesion and, and marginalization. All right. Any, any more comments? Um, not, not sort of much comment, but in terms of maybe the perception of, of maybe the tool, I think we are only looking into areas that we are covering and under them with that. Mm -hmm. And specifically, if I take example of Bedawa, where there had been that much community integration in terms of raising voices of uh, displacement affected communities um, compared to the host communities. So, sort of like seeing a, a you know, change of a shift in terms of. Um, the, the com local community also exception of, of the IDPs as being part of the wider community in terms of raising their needs or maybe having voice with, within the community structure. So that is also a yeah, shift. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Um, the next question is from uh, Khalid, who is asking, um, given the relatively large sample sizes, how did you ensure revisiting the same household for the panel survey? And uh, did you use self-administered survey, phone, or face-to-face -face interview? Yeah, um, very good question. And um, again, as with all of the technical um, questions, we're also happy to share more um, afterwards um, by email and um, documentation of, of the method. Um, we did face-to-face -face, um, interviews, uh, indeed. It was a complex process to really track down all of the ha these households. Um, we just had a very rigid system in place um, how and, and um, the enumerators or um, researchers were trained on how specifically to do this and how to track down um, these households. Um, I won't go into much more detail now, but I'm very happy to, to share this um, by email. If you could just um, share a request, um, then we will share more information um, on this, maybe just to say that there was a certain percentage of the households that had actually moved um, from the time we first surveyed them in 2019 until the time we last surveyed them um, at the end of 2021. Um, and as long as they were still within our area of operation, we did actually, um, in most cases, um, track them down and then interviewed them in their new location. However, if they moved beyond our area of programming, um, we weren't able to include them, but it was a relatively um, small uh, number of, of households for, for which this was the case. Um, so again, just reiterating um, the necessity to really put in place these um, rigid contract procedures in order to be able to um, still interview and find the household two, three years on. Uh, maybe to add on maybe what Lena said is that it wasn't that much easy in terms of tracking those IDPs or specific households. At some point we had to support the enumerators to, to get a specific household that has been partially evicted by certain eviction over the years of, of the three years. And then maybe they moved to somewhere within the proximity of our catchment area. Then at least we, those are also part of um, the people interviewed to maintain that consistency. Um, a, 
a comment and a question around social cohesion. So the comment is um, trust in, in institutions was a consistently important aspect of social cohesion influencing perceived integration, and I think we would all agree. Um, the question is, um, uh, how did Danoda come up with the criteria um, for social cohesion, since it seems not to fall squarely within the IASC framework, but is quite important? Yeah, good, good question, to which there isn't um, any simple answer. Maybe just to um, reiterate that what we surveyed weren't only um, the questions that then in the end, um, or the variables that fed into the model. So we might have also surveyed additional um, aspects that um, you might not, not now not be aware of. Um, so hence, I think for anyone who's interested in understanding a bit better which components and you know which subcomponents we actually did survey, um, I welcome you to um, to email to us um, for us to send to send to you the the specifics and also to read the um, Laura report, um, which should be out towards the end of of this week. Um, the Laura one report from 2019. You can already find it on on our um, website. Um, I think, yeah, maybe just linking back to um, uh, trust in institutions being so important. So any of these um, levels, um, we were rating on a Likert scale, so from one to five, um, and really tried not to be prescriptive at all, but to ask um, really open questions, um, and then specific to um, very many different um, types of institutions. But then, as I said, trust in institution wasn't the only um, social cohesion component that, that we used. It was just how um, we felt um, it would be more tangible. We also um, looked into uh, how IDPs are invited to host community members. We looked into their social standing, how they are perceived. We looked into um, whether IDPs and host community um, children and youth play together. Um, we looked into general perceptions of how are IDPs perceived by the host community and how might this change over time, etc. So, so it was a much um, wider range than just looking at trust in institutions. It is just that this specific um, aspect, this specific variable came out as um, very significant and it continued to be significant over the whole time span of, of the program. Maybe just one follow-up question on that and then one last question uh, to Jake. Um, on the issue of trust in institutions, one of the challenges is getting government to take lead. Um, and the question is, how have you managed to get meaningful involvement of government? <laughs> yeah, good question, an important question. Um, all of our um, programming is um, locally led, um, so this includes um, government leadership. This also includes um, a really strong component of community involvement. Um, a lot of our programming is based on community-based planning, um, feeding into community action plans that then feed into um, district plans, so again with the government heavily um, involved uh, with regards to, um, for example, feeding into the National Durable Solutions Strategy, um, etc. You know, in any of these processes, um, obviously, um, the government wasn't only heavily involved and consulted, but it was actually a, a co-creation um, of solutions. Um, and on that, maybe also to stress that where we've had the largest impact, where we would say you know, this really is an example of success, was in the areas where we really um, had government um, leadership and the government um, behind the idea of working towards durable solutions. Um, and Bawako is a key example for this, I think, and uh, you will hear more about it um, next week, Wednesday, if you hopefully tune in again. One. Uh any, any, think about? Go ahead, Ali, yeah. sorry. Uh, in, in terms of engagement, I think government was a key part uh, at, a, at the state level, like specifically for Southwest, where government played a key role in terms of uh, the whole program engagement, uh, partially contributing to the regional strategic plan level, uh, for which um, Southwest has in place. Uh, also, in terms of investment-wise, also government had a stake and also engagement like the provision of land space for building health facilities in, in, in Baidawa. So that was a bit more encouraging in terms of the level of government engagement and ownership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, this question is uh, framed uh, for FCDO, so <laughs> apologies for the exclusion. Um, <coughs> 
So it sounds like FCDO has a large risk appetite looking at the level of investments that uh, you know have gone into in, into this. Um, and, and particularly around adaptive approach and the development of you know complex measuring tools. So is this the beginning? Are we likely to see more investments um, in this type of work in the future? Um, yes, I mean, I think is a short answer. Um, I mean, obviously we're, we're coming to the end of our um, multi-year humanitarian and resilience program now, um, actually uh, ending um, this month, although we will be having a, a sort of short extension um, while we uh, sort of uh, go through the process of finalizing our next uh, multi-year program, which we uh, hope to start later this year. Um, I think we're, we're, I mean, we're, we're broadly um, quite, quite happy with the, the way we've sort of structured um, and I suppose balanced our investments in terms of um, so sort of humanitarian response, um, but then also making those investments into preventative action, uh, particularly in terms of resilience and durable solutions. Uh, I think given um, the nature of, uh, of Somalia as a, hum as a protracted humanitarian crisis, um, it is, you know, it, it's still very much warranted that, um, you know, FCDO's humanitarian investments are still, still continue to support these, um, uh, these, these interventions and ways of working which actually look to um, reduce need or, or prevent need. Um, and you know the, the elements of, of, sort of adaptation and learning will, will absolutely keep, um, continue to be sort of um, at the forefront of those of those programs moving forward. Um, there's one last question um, from Sarah, um, and uh, she's asking, um, presumably, uh, that uh, Laura um, uh, surveyed the same components, um, the same population, same components. Um, across the different times. Um, otherwise, how would we compare the results? So I think the question is around the same um, uh, respondents with the same components across time. Yeah, very, very short answer. The answer is yes. So um, the same components um, and the same households. And um, those very few households, as I referred to earlier, that we weren't able to track down, um, they were dropped from the survey um, altogether. And the same components, yes. Um, maybe with, with um, slight moderations, there were a few questions um, that we, for example, didn't have in the baseline in 2019 that we then um, realized were important that we then um, added in later on. But um, none of the questions that we slightly revised or added in later on um, were relevant um, for the two models that I described earlier. The, um, uh, perceived levels of integration for IDPs um, or the inequalities between host community and IDPs, but it was just added um, data generation, added information um, that we generated on top of what we used for these models, just in order to better contextualize uh, our findings. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, just one last uh, shout out to Paul, Jane. Um, in, the content, in the comment section, or the chat section, um, has provided a bit more context. Also, have a look at, uh, at that. Um, and thank you very much. I'll hand it back to Lena. Thanks very much for, for participating. Um, for more information, please uh, visit our website. We would really love to hear from you. As I said earlier, please do send us emails with any additional questions, with any feedback, with any suggestions you may have. We hope you found this learning event um, informative and thank you very much for your participation.